Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? I am so excited to share today's conversation. I feel like this topic should be in school curriculums all around the world. My guest today is Raven Rose. Raven is a reproductive health herbalist and traditional medicine practitioner. She has studied women's herbalism and traditional healing practices in Denver, Colorado, the Yucatan, and the Peruvian Amazon. In her journey, Raven was able to overcome debilitating period pain through embracing her cyclical body, restoring ancestral wisdom, and connecting to nature. In her work, she helps others bring balance to their cyclical bodies through connection with plants, ancestral guides, and grounded spiritual practice. In today's episode, Raven shares her own journey in healing her menstrual cycle, learning to recognize when your body is trying to tell you something, her experience with combo and how it helps her clients detoxify spiritually, mentally, and physically. She also shares about how our menstrual phases are connected to the phases of the moon, and how we can leverage that energy to our advantage and get into a state of flow as opposed to pushing. How we go through different cycles of creation and destruction, how to connect with your inner wisdom, and so much more. Come get cozy and join our conversation. Um, Welcome, Raven. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Yeah, so I, I'm uh, currently living in Florida. I spent most of my years in Florida, but I had about eight years living in North Carolina in a, a little town called Nightdale, and that was really um, impactful for me. I really loved being there and um, just growing up in a place that was so beautiful and clean. Um, that actually had a really big influence on my life. And um, yeah, but now I live in South Florida and it's really like right now it's wonderful. It's like so sunny and so nice to go bike riding every day, even in the winter time. It's really oh, lovely. I'm not, I'm not envious at all. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of your favorite memories growing up? Mm, um I would say probably just hanging out with family. I, um, my family would go, my like parents and my sister, we would go up to New York every summer and my sister and I would spend summers there and we just had so much fun hanging out with our cousins and that was really amazing. And then um, as a kid, my, some of my best memories are like when I would go for bike rides and like go to the park and just swing on the swings or like I spent a lot of time reading and actually my sister sent me a picture of myself as a kid and I was just laying in the grass on like a beach towel with my like shorts and t-shirt on and like I had my sunglasses on and I'm like laying there with a book on my chest just like looking (laughs) up the clouds I'm like yeah yeah that's me I spent a lot of time reading and just like um, I was really into dream work as a kid and and that was really fun for me too. I loved going to book fairs and things like that. Oh, I can relate. I It's so easy to get lost in a book, completely tra- transported to another place and it's so magical. It is, it is. What were some of your favorite books as a kid? Do you remember? Oh, yes, definitely. I used to love like Fear Street and Goosebumps, like all those like mystery things. And like, yeah. um, I loved uh, Ghost Rider, which I think was a show, but it was like this mystery show where you had to like try and figure out all the clues to this crime or something like that. I was really into like all the, um, like the suspense and like crime and um, like mystery things. Yeah, yeah. Do you think some of that interest 
got it's part of what you do nowadays definitely i think so just um doing that deep exploration and kind of like seeing behind what um is like most obvious or like kind of see looking behind the veil i do a lot of looking behind the veil so yeah definitely that shows up for me oh well so tell us a little bit about what you do <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a menstrual health herbalist and I I would say I'm um I do a lot of work in ancestry and um healing the menstrual cycle and really just healing our connection with nature. Um so most of my work is in helping people who have difficult menstrual cycles with um finding balance in their menstrual cycle and doing that through connecting with plant medicines and connecting with ancestors and working through some of the more uh the deeper aspects of uh health imbalances and um although i've kind of like really started in the menstrual cycle all of the things that i've learned about healing apply to any healing process but my focus has been mostly on the menstrual cycle and just reviving that um sacred cycle within us and helping people to like connect with that and see it as a as a as an aspect of ourselves that is really powerful and connected to nature and something that can help direct us in our lives rather than something that we're fighting and something that's a dread or something that is like holding us back in some way. Mm, that's so powerful. It's funny because I started to learn more about the menstrual cycle and as a woman the story that were fed to us was that it's a dread it happens, you know, 7 days a week mm -hmm. and those are all the horrible things that happen to you but learning to sort of reclaim that power and understand that there is sort of like a divinity into it and it doesn't have to be painful that's something i recently learned because growing up i had either really bad cycles or i stopped having a cycle for like an entire year because of stress so all those things that the more i talk about it the more women are like oh yeah i don't get my cycles for you know for months or yeah i can't get out of bed when i'm on my cycle and then realizing that's not supposed to be the norm yeah yeah and you know like you said it's something that when we're growing up we're kind of taught that oh this is just what happens when you have your cycle but actually it's not normal to have really painful cycles and it's a message from our body that something is wrong and something is out of balance and something wants to be healed and i think it kind of goes in line with all the other ways that we learn to stop listening to our bodies um so the menstrual cycle is another a um way that we're taught to just you know don't listen to your body it's 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 normal everything that you're feeling is normal but it's not and mm -hmm. i feel like that's a message that a lot of us get um even earlier on and uh not listening to our bodies and not trusting ourselves mm, yeah or trying to numb it with a painkiller yeah that's yeah. so common and we do that with physical illness but also menstrual mm -hmm. cycles you share this really yeah. really I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, um yeah, it's just, you know, with with the pain, there's so much for us to learn about ourselves and of course, it's not comfortable and there are ways that we can work with um pain management like with herbs and things like that that where we can help to like tone down the pain but also still be able to gather information from it. Um, I think that's really important being able to know that there's there's information there for us that can help us not only in our menstrual cycle but in everything that we do. I was going to share a quote that you shared on social media which was painful cycles are a calling not a burden. Yes, I love that. <laughs> that is just that is really truly like the epitome of my work. It's recognizing that the a painful menstrual cycle or an imbalanced menstrual cycle is an opportunity for us to discover more of ourselves and to discover how to release and transform some ancestral burdens or traumas and start to heal ourselves in a really deep way but also to access more of who we are and to be able to experience more of who we are through our connection with our body and our menstrual cycle and the healing process 
because the healing process is, it's a beautiful thing that it's a, it's a way for us to learn more about ourselves and our gifts and our blessings and learn about what ways we could be stopping ourselves from sharing that with the world. And usually when there's an imbalance in the menstrual cycle, it's some kind of stagnation and some kind of stuck energy. And when we find balance in the menstrual cycle, we're also able to have that flow and that energetic flow happen in all other areas of our life. So it's truly a calling to discover ourselves and discover our joy and discover our gifts and be able to carry that out into the world. So powerful. Mm -hmm. Was that how your journey started? Your interest in menstrual health? I actually started my journey in my own healing process. I started having really painful cycles when I was about 16 years old. And at the time, I didn't know anything about the menstrual cycle. I didn't know how to heal myself. I didn't know what was going on. So I went to the doctor and um, they gave me painkillers and it wasn't strong enough. My pain was like beyond the 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. And oh. so um, I was put on birth control and I was on birth control for seven years and I had to switch to a few different pills because it was making me really depressed, really just, um, I was not myself at all. And I was experiencing all of the negative side effects of the birth control. And eventually I, I had switched to a few different pills. I was on a pill that almost caused me to have kidney failure. And at that point I was oh like, God. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. So I switched doctors as well and started seeing a doctor who was really open to like herbs and just alternative healing and actually suggested that I um, see an acupuncturist and start taking some herbs. And I was like, oh, wow, this is great. And um, the doctor said that maybe you have endometriosis. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, I'd never heard that word before. No one had ever said anything to me like that. And so I went home, I remember I went home and I was just like, crying because I was like oh my gosh all these years I've been dealing with this and nobody could tell me what was happening and I went through so much pain and suffering with being on the pill and then eventually I was like okay I'm doing this I'm gonna figure this out and I started with meditation and changing my diet and those were the first things that really helped me at the so when I first started having pain I had pain like two days a month after being on birth control for seven years I had pain 10 days a month so I was like really having a difficult time and um, I was taking painkillers to manage and to be able to go to work and to do things like that but I my goal was like I want to get off of these painkillers and I want to be able to heal myself and I also had some other goals that were really important like I wanted to work for myself I didn't want to work at like a nine to five job anymore I just I knew that that wasn't for me and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I also knew that I wanted to like spend some more time traveling and I wanted to like I wanted to learn about tarot and all these other things and as I was working through my healing process with my menstrual cycle and you know changing my diet I started learning about tarot and I started getting into ancestral work and in guidance and when I started hitting some blocks with my healing where I got my pain back down to two days but it was still really excruciating and I was like I need some I need some more help I had like exhausted all of my resources as far as diet and lifestyle changes that and things that I would read about online or in books and I was like something else is going on here and that's when I started really getting into ancestral um, healing and asking my ancestors for help and from there I was guided to start studying herbalism and that was a really exciting journey and I did uh, three years of herb school and I had an opportunity to go to the Yucatan and study womb massage. And that was really amazing. And I also had an opportunity to go to, um, to Peru, to the Amazon jungle. I was living in the jungle for about a month oh. and I was studying how to work with combo. And that was really yeah. powerful. Um, and I just had all these amazing experiences along the way in my healing process. And as I got to the point where I was really, I had really seen a big change in my own menstrual health and I was starting people were actually starting to come to me and I was like oh wow I guess this is what I'm doing now right. <laughs> and I started to help other people and I was like wow so like I looked back and I was like oh my gosh all these things that I wanted 
way back when I was starting my healing process, now they've come to fruition and I have my own business and I love the work that I do. I am like deeply, like I, I had learned, not only did I learn tarot, but I actually learned tarot through dreaming with my ancestors, which was really powerful. Wow. And I just like had all these wonderful experiences come to life. I got to travel and I got to, you know, just learn so much about myself and experience this really powerful and rich journey through that healing process. And also have now cycles that are like so manageable and um, it's just completely like, it was such a beautiful journey and process, but you know, starting out when I was just in so much pain and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know that all of this was coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> it really yeah. opened up such like a, a doorway for you to kind of just walk through. It was almost like you you were on the other side for the longest time. You just had yeah. to cross over. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How did you first start it? You mentioned herbs and I have a little bit of experience with Chinese medicine because that was also a suggestion from my mom who mm -hmm. she is more about Eastern medicine, listen to your body while my dad is like, pop all the pills that you can <laughs> because he's like, I believe in medicine. So I think I had a really good balance and I was put on birth control when I was on 17 because when I was 17, because mm -hmm. I wasn't getting my period and the doctors were like, you're too stressed. I'm like, what do you mean I'm too stressed? I feel okay. Like you're too stressed at school. So my mom, after a while, was like, here's some Chinese medicine and that helped. And it brought me a period it brought my period back after not having it for almost like a year. I wasn't worried because I wasn't doing any anything that would be like, oh, you're pregnant or anything like that. But I, I was worried that it would affect my fertility. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm like, give me the Chinese medicine. But for anyone who is not used to that notion or they don't know where to ask for help, what would be the first step? Yeah, I would say the first step is to learn how your menstrual cycle works. That is like number one. That's something that unfortunately we don't really get a clear education on. Like if you know how your menstrual cycle works and what's supposed to happen with your hormones and what um, and also the different energies of the menstrual phases through the month, that really lets you know a lot about your body. And you start to develop a really good connection with your body and start to understand your body. And from there, you can start to explore other things like maybe working with herbal medicine, maybe looking into working with an herbalist or an acupuncturist. Um, those are really great places to start. And I would say also tracking your cycle. So there's really great apps for tracking your cycle, but I would say look into um, something called the fertility awareness method. A lot of times it's used for um, either preventing pregnancy or for promoting fertility for people who want to get pregnant, but it can also just be a way of getting to know your body and the different phases of your menstrual cycle. You get to know like when we get to ovulation and our temperature, our waking temperature rises, which is called our basal body temperature. When that rises, that lets you know that ovulation happened and now you're in your luteal phase. You're moving into the phase of your cycle where um, your, your energy is start to, starting to move more inward. You're more focused on doing rather than the mental um, focus that was in the previous phase. And also you're getting to a phase where you're going to start noticing a stronger intuition and you're going to start picking up on energies of people around you. And you're gonna start kind of picking up on disharmony and imbalance because after the luteal phase comes menstruation and that's when you have an opportunity to release. So having those insights around, hey, this is kind of out of balance for me. Those are really great things to pay attention to. That way, when you get to menstruation, you're like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to say, to consciously release things that I want to do that are happening in my life or make adjustments to the kind of relationships that I have or connections that I have with people and really start to like collaborate with your menstrual cycle and mm -hmm. work with it rather than kind of like fighting against it and ignoring the signs and signals that we're getting from our body that are so wise and teaching us so much about ourselves and 
and um, our connection with nature and, and people and our communities and things like that. So I would say just starting with understanding your menstrual cycle and understanding the phases and the different energies, that's a really great place to start. I love how you mentioned collaborating with your cycle and your body. It's about working together after all. Yeah, absolutely. I know you talked a little bit about the phases, but what are the, is it four phases that we go through? There's like follicular, menstrual. Can you talk about that in a little bit more <laughs> better yeah. order than how I shared it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the first phase is going to be menstruation. That's the start of the menstrual cycle. And the menstrual phase is a more resting energy and more inward energy. Um, it's not really a time for us to be going out and creating new things and putting all this energy in, in our outward world. It's a really great time for getting clarity on what we want to release and what we want to release so that our next cycle can be better in, in whatever way that we're looking to improve our lives. And that can be in like our menstrual cycle, it could be in the uh, like in our day-to-day -day lives, in our work, and could be in our relationships. But really it's about nourishing ourselves and taking time for ourselves to allow that release of energy. Um, because as we're releasing blood, we're also releasing emotions, releasing anything that's built up during the month. So that's the start. Um, and then we move into the follicular phase and that's associated with the waxing moon. So the moon in the menstruation phase was like dark in the sky. Now we're moving into you're starting to see that crescent, that light come back mm -hmm. into the sky. That's our energy just like coming back. Our hormones are like coming back up again. Um, so estrogen is starting to rise. We're more social, we're more outward, we're more, um, it's a really strong like mental focus also. Uh, we have a lot of clarity. It's really great for planning and visioning and all of those things. So that's a really great time to like put start putting things into place and, uh, in the sense of like doing your planning work and connecting with people, collaborating with people. And really it's that outward focus. That's the, that phase. And then the next phase, which is ovulation. Um, those two phases are the ones that are kind of like praised in our modern society, mm -hmm. as far as like being that outward creative energy and, and producing and putting things out into the world. So after the filter phase comes ovulation, that's associated with the full moon. And that's, again, that really outward creative, it's also very sensual and flirtatious energy. It's when we're most fertile in our cycle. And so it's natural for us to be flirting and just chatting and having a great time and really sensual. Also, um, I really like ovulation time for anything that you are wanting to pull and in, create in, in the world. That's a really great time to start taking action. And then you move into the luteal phase, which is continuing that action and really grounding things. So the follicular phase was more up here in the, in the mind and um, the more like mental energy. And then the luteal phase is kind of bringing it back down and putting the seeds into the earth and doing the actual work. And so that's a phase where it is more about the physical body and um, kind of connecting to work that's more action oriented and and about movement I find that it's really hard for me to sit at a computer and like try and like get ideas out during my luteal phase <laughs> it's much easier to do that in the follicular phase when the ideas are just flowing and it's just mm -hmm. easy it's mental energy luteal is more like um, the actions and it's also energetically when we are starting to get more dreams and just being, uh, we're more aware and intuitive. So we're, we're more connected to the unseen realms in our luteal phase, especially as we start to get closer to menstruation again. Yeah, so that's a really great time for dream work. It's a really great time for one, also like paying attention to the messages that we receive and taking action on them. So maybe not right away, maybe if um, something comes up and it's really emotional, observing those emotions, journaling, and then, and then speaking to it, speaking about it, not letting things get stuck. Because the last thing we want before we're about to start releasing is to close things off. And a lot of times um, we are closing off those emotions and thoughts because society tells us that we're just being moody or we're not like 
um, PMSing. You know, that's like keep the it worst together. Term. Yeah, PMSing. Yeah. Exactly. It's the worst. <sighs> yeah. No, there's there's something there. There's something behind it. We're picking up on things that are real and are truths, and it's a it's a time when, you know, in the past it may have been like really disruptive and I mean presently as well just really disruptive when someone who menstruates or a woman is like you know what this isn't working and we'll start to make changes and start to shift things and it kind of um, goes against the linear model (laughs) of life and just like going ahead and just like ignoring all the signs and just like powering through um, that's not the way it is with this phase. It's like, okay, this, these changes need to be made. That way we can do things more efficiently and do things more in line with what's actually working and what actually is like collaborating with our own truth and our own desire and what, what it is that we're creating in the world. So that phase is like one of the, um, more misunderstood phases and that one along with menstruation are the phases that, unfortunately don't get enough love and um, attention. And those are the phases that we kind of like view as being more um, um, not in line with, with the modern world. Yeah. With the masculine energy of pushing. That's basically flow energy from how I've learned it from experience because I was all push, push, push until like collapse. So now that I'm have more time and space to be more inwards. I've started testing out, adapting my business to my different energy, like seeing people when I'm Mm. the most social and then resting during the, I cannot pronounce it, luteal, luteal phase. Luteal, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, during the luteal, I used to say luteal, in the luteal phase. And it's helped to not fight that energy because your body wants to do what it needs to do. And our minds are like, let's yes. get this. Let's just get this last set line. And I was like, if it's not happening, it's not happening. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's a really great way to uh, work with the menstrual cycle and work with that energy. It's so much, it's so nice when you're in that flow and things are just easier. <laughs> it's just yeah. easier when you're, when your your body is supporting you in the work that you're wanting to do and the work that you're putting out into the world. It's just, it's so nice. It is. And to know that it's, cause there's also a lot of FOMO in the way that society runs. You have to get this idea out yeah. everything right away. But I think in embracing the cycle, we also come into a place of trust Maybe, you know, I wanted to do this this week, but I couldn't and it will come back to me when it's meant to. Yes. Yes. And then when it comes back, it's so beautiful how it's just so much, it's easier, it's more impactful and it has more meaning and depth. So it's, it's a really like beautiful process to flow with the natural cycles and because our menstrual cycle is a cycle of nature it's like nature happening nature cycle happening in our body so as we are able to listen to those signs we're able to connect more deeply with nature and kind of go with the flow of nature and things happen with greater ease and it's really really beautiful oh i love that for anyone listening i've learned so much i hope you can start applying this i also noticed when you mentioned vivid dreams i've been having a lot of vivid dreams but they get even more vivid before my period and i thought it was just you know i'm getting dreams but i never understood how to interpret them so how does dream work work (laughs) yeah so um i love dream work so Right before we start to, right before menstruation starts, we get this really great open uh, window of uh, new information coming through. And what I see is that in the luteal phase, as we get towards the end of it, we're kind of like in in between worlds. Um, we're in between that creation energy and then the destruction energy, the that transition time. Um, It's a time when for us personally, the veils are really thin and we're able to receive a lot of information. And dream work is so, so powerful. We get information from our ancestors. We get information from um, just our our guides, our um, our own thoughts and desires about what we want to move towards in our life. We get so much information about how to 
move towards that. And anything that could be holding us back, those dreams are like the best for understanding what we can release and what it is that we're working through personally on a deeper level that could be holding us back from our, um, our visions for ourselves. So with dream work, the most important thing is to keep a dream journal next to the bed. And when you wake up, write down anything that you remember. So if you remember your dream, write that down. If you just remember a feeling, write that down. If you remember a, uh, if you don't remember anything, write down the first thought that you have when you wake up or write down the sensations that you feel in your body when you wake up. And as you start to do the, that practice, you'll start to receive more and more information. And, and then also how, what I love about dreaming and um, really stepping into dream work is that it helps us to create a better relationship with night and just the natural cycles of light and dark in our lives. And so as the sun is going down the night before, that's your time to start thinking about this opportunity now, like surrendering to the night and surrendering to the wisdom that your subconscious and your, your dreaming body has to share with you. Um, and I think a lot of people are um, hopefully coming out of this um, like energy of constantly pushing and um, kind of being disconnected from sleep and having a lot of sleep disturbances and stepping into the dream space and really inviting in the dream is a really great way to reconnect with our natural cycles and also reconnect with the guidance that we're always receiving because as we start to see things in our dreams and start to write about them, then we'll start to see how those dreams are connected to things in our waking life too. So it's this really nice balance of like, oh, you know what? That reminds me of that dream that I had. I wonder if there's a connection there. And then we start to see all these ways that you're being supported in your waking and your dreaming life. And that's really, really cool. Oh, that's amazing. Like we have so much more, so much power we're sitting on. But we're driven, yeah. so driven by the mental because there's also such a huge badge of honor for people who don't sleep, which it's like mm -hmm. you pushing so much sleeping. I like how you mentioned destruction, creation and destruction, because it has to, it's kind of how it balances itself. Things are constantly being created. Yeah. Things need to be destroyed and let go of and embracing that energy of the night that was beautiful I'm I'm absorbing <laughs> I'm absorbing that message yeah it's um it's so powerful and that's been a really big focus for me personally lately just um reconnecting with night and I've always been someone like um I love to do this this ritual where um either around the full moon or a new moon um or just at different times, I kind of connect it more to my menstrual cycle. And sometimes I bleed with the new moon, sometimes I bleed with the full moon, but I like to do a ritual around ovulation where I'll, um, I'll do a sundown ritual. So once the sun goes down, no screens, no um, lights or anything like that, only candlelight if I want to have light. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's so nice. It's so it's such a great way to connect with your body. And I like to go out it um, doesn't matter if it's like a new moon, full moon or anything. I'll just go out and let the moonlight um, be on my body and connect with the stars in the sky. And um, it's, it's just a, such a nice way to remember where we come from and kind of pull back from the modern world a little bit and reconnect with ourselves, reconnect with our own wisdom. And as we learn to like move through night and um, kind of like without all the artificial light, we're also like awakening something within ourselves that helps us to work through the shadow aspects of ourselves and also work through some of maybe the challenges that we're having in our waking life because we have this nice quiet slowdown and mm -hmm. there's that quiet night energy that is there to support us. And it's, it's really beautiful. So I definitely, I always suggest that to clients. I suggest that to everyone, like do your sundown ritual and just see what, what is waiting for you in the night. Oh, I love that. I'm definitely trying that out. Just the way you described it and then thinking about the night and the stars. Ah, oh, I, I'll let you know what comes out from that.
Yeah, it's also a really great way to kind of um, reconnect your circadian rhythm to the um, to the natural cycles of light and dark, which is always helpful. And it's really helpful for hormonal balance for people who have imbalanced menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. That is super helpful. Also, yeah. what about, I don't know if you have, if the cycle can also affect your quality of sleep, even when you're not on the cycle, if the hormones are out of balance. Yes, definitely. Um, so it's, it's interesting because it's so intertwined with um, our stress levels and things like that. So our menstrual cycle goes out of balance for so many reasons, but the main one being stress. And that could be external stress, that could be from foods that we're eating, it could be from pesticides, it could be from environmental toxins like fragrance or um, other things that are in our chemicals in our environment, like from cleaning products and all those things. But then there's also stress that we get from our from our own mind and how we choose to work and how we choose to move through the world. And a lot of times we put a lot of stress on ourselves to adhere to a, a way of life that is not aligned with our bodies and is not aligned with nature. And that brings up a lot of issues. And that's just like, you know, working too hard or staying up really late to try and meet a deadline or something like that. All of those things have a really big impact on our menstrual cycles. And then there's the, uh, the emotional aspect of it and how we sometimes go into patterns because of things that we've learned as a kid and things that have to do with really powerful and deep aspects of ourselves like self-worth and self-love and um, being able to speak our truth and use our voice. Um, all of those have so many different manifestations and um, it can show up in how we, sh how we interact with people. I know for me, it showed up in my relationships. And um, so as you start to kind of like bring light to those things, then there's a, there's a balancing that happens. And so with like with my healing, it was so much about, um, yes, changing my foods and changing the things in my outdoor external environment, but also changing how I was working and how, um, like why I started looking at why I was in relationship with certain people and what that, what it was that I was actually looking for and how that was connected to like my ancestry and things that I experienced as a kid and things that I experienced with my family and all of that kind of like connected back to the menstrual cycle and being able to bring balance mm -hmm. to it. But um, as far as sleep, it's like, there's so many layers there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's so many layers. <laughs> and <laughs> as we start to create a better relationship with sleep and with night and dreaming, then we're also creating a better relationship with our cycles. And, um, I, you know, we can take any aspect of our life that we want to improve. So say it's sleep. And as you start to say, well, what's disturbing my sleep and asking those questions and starting to make changes, maybe you're putting down your phone two hours before bed and maybe you're noticing that, you know, I keep, I don't know why, but I just, I have at, every night, I just want to like watch TV and eat food. And, and I know that this is actually not the best thing for sleeping. So why do I keep doing this? And then you start to explore that and start to find that actually it's connected to maybe some kind of, um, maybe something that has to do with self-worth or maybe that's something that has to do with like how you may have comforted yourself as a child when you were in a time of stress or trauma. So that comes to the surface. And as you work through that, then you can actually have a deeper transformation and that transformation has an impact on the menstrual cycle too. So it's also interconnected. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, it's block energy, right? Even those little things that you grew up with without knowing, it becomes block energy if you not you don't address it. Exactly. That's so fascinating. And how did you find your way into ancestral work? Because that sounds so interesting as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was at that point in my healing process where I just I couldn't find the next step. And I remember having a cycle where I was just in such excruciating pain. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was actually because there was gluten in my, this new shampoo that I got. 
Um, but at the time I was just like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. That was really, that was really intense, really painful. And I, um, I was in so much pain. It was like being in this, it was like being in an abyss and it was, I was completely, uh, I just couldn't understand how someone could experience so much pain and still be alive. It was like that intense. And I said, I asked myself, as I was in pain, I was like, maybe I was cursed in another lifetime. And I, after, after the pain subsided and I started to like come back, I was like, you know, there's something there. I don't necessarily think I was cursed, but maybe this has something to do with another lifetime, or maybe this could come from ancestry. Um, And that's when I started to explore past lives. And I started asking my ancestors for guidance and like, what next step do I need to take? And then from there, uh, I started receiving a lot of guidance on like, oh, like going to herb school and things like that. But then um, as I continued on with that ancestral work, I started looking at the patterns of imbalance in my family and patterns of imbalance in myself and how that was connected to my ancestry. And um, a lot of a lot of patterns have to do with um, like really oppressed feminine energy. um, sexual trauma against uh, women in my lineage, which is something that many, many, many of us have experienced, and also um, had to do with slavery and the enslavement of some of my ancestors. So there was so many things that came from that, and um, so many traumas that kind of like trickled down, and were still being exhibited in different ways. And as I was working with my ancestors, I was basically able to see how. I was still exhibiting some of those patterns and how it was showing up in my day-to-day life. And then I could make changes to me. And as I did those changes for myself, it helped to heal the trauma of my ancestors as well. So ancestral lineage healing for me is more so about I'm doing my work and recognizing how those imbalances are showing up within me and how, and my ancestors are collaborating and helping me to find balance in myself Uh, That way I can tap into more of the ancestral blessings and kind of continue on all of the deeper work that they were doing in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a really beautiful like process of self-discovery and um, healing on this really deep level for myself and being able to access more joy and more uh, be more connected to my own abundance and be more connected to uh, love and all those wonderful things that our ancestors want for us. Right. It's so beautiful because we forget about how connected we are to each other and also the people that came before us and generational trauma and all that work heals yourself, but it can also heal those who are no longer in us physic with us physically. Yeah. yeah. And it also has an impact on everyone else that's in all the living descendants in the lineage Mm -hmm. so not maybe they're you know everyone's on their own path but as we do our own work and that has an impact on our our lineages there can be little shifts and um, other people in our family can open up to healing as well Um, of course it's up to them to take that step if they want to do that in whatever way it looks like for them because it doesn't necessarily have to be like doing ancestral work maybe it's maybe they decide to make a change in their diet or maybe they decide to make a change in the way they're thinking about something or maybe they kind of soften up to other people in the family Um, but there's a really beautiful thing that happens when we do our ancestral work and how it helps connect us to our living family as well and for me now, a big part of my ancestor work is being connected to my living family and being able to connect with them, um, have conversations with them and support them in their lives. What if you're interested in doing the ancestral work and but your family doesn't believe in it? Can yeah, you that's still a really heal? good question. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. And um, this is actually, I, so one of my clients was um, really interested in ancestor work and we started working together and she wanted to connect more deeply and and heal some trauma in her lineage. And so we did a session and got some really great information from her ancestors about um, practices that she could do to help herself, but would also 
potentially help her family. And so she put things into place, put things into practice. And then um, one of the things that she was to do was to, before going to this family reunion, basically um, her and her mother and her sister actually were like, okay, we'll, we'll do this. And it was just something simple, just lighting a white candle and um, just saying thank you to the ancestors that came before and to all the ancestors that will be there at this um, family reunion. And um, so they did that. And previously where the, uh, when they had family gatherings, the men in the family would not talk to the women. They would only talk to them to give them orders, to Whoa. tell them things to do, to thanks to bring them. And they were very, like, very extremely racist, very sexist, very just like closed off from love. And um, so they, she went to this family reunion and noticed that the men started talking to the women in the family. And it was like this shift. And I'm like, that is huge. That is really, really huge. That little opening can, you know, bring about a lot of change and hopefully continue to shift and change and make and that to me is so powerful because that shifts how that person is now relating with not only with women but with all the other people that they come into contact with in their lives so that's pretty powerful work yeah that is so powerful and I'm already trying to spin my head around wrap my head around so many people who can benefit from it because a lot of immigrant children they've see the wounds of their parents that they've carried but maybe their families are not in the space of doing the self-work and just the thought of you know the kids or the newer generations willing to do it it can heal even if they are not aware of it that's so powerful Raven yeah. oh my gosh I got chills from is. that <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my gosh when she told me that I was like what? I was in total shock. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I was yeah. <laughs> at, from that point out, I was like, wow, ancestor work is so important. Mm. What can people expect from an um, ancestral session with you? Yeah, so um, I used to use tarot a lot in my ancestral sessions and um, I still do use it sometimes. It's something that I found to be um, really helpful for just like um, connecting with ancestors in a really, um, and just being able to receive messages. So usually in a session, we'll talk and kind of find out what is happening in their lives and um, what it is that they're working on. And that will kind of direct things. So when I pull cards or um, sometimes I don't have to pull cards lately, I haven't been pulling cards and the, the information is just coming through just and it's really cool to see that happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, pull cards or not. And um, as the ancestors come through, they're giving a lot of really practical information. So things that people can do and put into place to help them open up to greater wisdom within themselves and a lot of the ancestor work, it's not so much about me telling people what to do and then go do it and then they come back for more information. It's more so about getting information that they can put into place and then be able to start to have their own direct connection with their ancestors and start to have their own direct connection with receiving guidance and wisdom. Um, because that's really what it's about. It's like being able to tap into that ancestral knowledge and how our ancestors were able to solve problems in their lives through their connection with different plants, with different rituals, with um, some ancestors have a really strong connection with earth energy and stones and crystals. Some ancestors have a really strong connection with plants and plant medicines. And then others have a really strong connection with like stars and um, cycles of like the moon and um, light and dark and things like that. So there's a lot of like ritual kind of practices that come through. And then that way people have some practices for them to like go and do and start to revive that information. And as they go through that process of either working with the plant medicines or doing the rituals, then they wake up these, this part of themselves that was just waiting to be spoken to and waiting to you know, open up to this conversation with the ancestors. And a lot of times there are also little symbols that will come through from ancestors. Like 
yesterday I had a session with a client and um, after we spoke and she shared her story, I, I was like, you know, there's this really strong message coming through about connecting with the soil and connecting with roots and um, specifically connecting with like root work, like um, South, um, like in the South in America, like um, root work. And, and I was like, maybe even like working with soil and putting your hands in the soil. And she's like, oh my gosh. And she held up this book and it's called Working the Roots. And it's all about like deep South, like root work and also um, farming practices and the magic behind that. So I was just like, okay, your ancestors are with you. And this is just, this message was just so you can see that they're with you and to follow those intuitions that you're having and those, those little messages that you're getting. Oh, that's beautiful. And you get to do this work all the time. Yeah, it's so awesome. I absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> Part of also um, your work is Campbell. Do you want to talk a little yes. bit more about it? I remember when you first told me, I, yeah. I yes, tell me more. <laughs> yeah, so Kumbo is such a powerful um, medicine to work with. It is a frog poison from the green monkey tree frog um, that lives in the Amazon. And it's, so it, it is a poison and it pushes our um, our body to release toxins. And one of the big things that I love about it is that it helps to kind of lift the cloud of um, energies that we could be could have been in um, in our physical body, but also just in our space, in our headspace, in our emotions. Combo is a really powerful mover and opener. And basically, when you're in a combo ceremony, there are superficial burns that go in the skin, and then the poison goes on top of that. And um, you have to drink two liters of water beforehand. And once the poison goes on, you can feel it move throughout your body. And then there's a purging that happens. And um, usually the purging is like throwing up. Sometimes people are going to the toilet. Sometimes people are crying, but there's a release that's happening. And after that intense part of it is maybe like 15 minutes. And then you start to kind of come down and start to rest and um, just like settle back in. And the first thing that people notice usually is like clarity, this clarity that comes through. So whereas like for me, I know before I was so unclear before my first combo ceremony, I was so unclear about how to move forward in my healing, what to do next. And I just kind of felt defeated and kind of felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere. And after my combo ceremony, I felt this strength come into me and like this cloud lifted. And I didn't necessarily know what was going to happen next, but mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, I can do this. I can keep going. I have the strength to, to, to keep continue on my journey. And physically, it's really great for releasing toxins from the body. So all the things that get built up, um, especially after all the years of being on birth control for me, I think it was really helpful for um, hormonal balance because as the more toxins we have in our body, the more imbalanced our menstrual cycle is. So that was really helpful in the physical sense. And then in that energetic sense, it was like this cloud being lifted. And that's another thing that a lot of people experience is like this release of like this heavy energy that may have been looming around them that could have been clouding your thoughts or in, in your decisions and all of those things. So that gets lifted and there's that clarity that comes in. And I kind of like to um, call combo a, a road opener because mm -hmm. it really does open our path and allow us to see the path ahead, at least that next step. And if we take the steps of making other changes in our lives, like changing our diet and making sure that we are taking the best care of ourselves that we can, then we get to enjoy a, a lasting impact from that combo ceremony. And um, one thing that I, I always stress is that combo is really powerful and can really help people with really deep um, healing in the physical, emotional, and energetic sense and ancestrally, but it's up to us to kind of um, take the steps after the ceremony mm -hmm. to continue on in our healing work and not just expect, you know, this frog everything medicine to, to, to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> 
I love that you brought that up because even with healing, it's not necessarily a linear transition. It's, it goes all around and there's different phases and stages and people will think, you know, I did the one thing, then I expect these kind of results, but it's kind of getting in our own way by thinking like that. It is, it really is because there's so many layers and there will, there will always, always be tests and <laughs> did you really learn yeah. that lesson? Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, <yeah. laughs> and there's always something deeper. So, and this is something like after 10 years of like really diving into healing and exploring that for myself now for me, whereas before my, my focus was so much on pain, I got to a point where I realized that healing doesn't necessarily have to be all about pain. Healing can be, we can heal through joy. We can heal through Mm -hmm. um, fun. We can heal through like these really beautiful loving experiences and it doesn't always have to be about pain. And some, and I, for me, one thing that's been really healing is allowing myself to not focus so much on pain anymore. And that was really transformative and powerful. And the journey continues as far as healing goes, but Um, healing is this really, it's really, to me, healing is about being engaged in our journey of life and um, really wanting to interact with ourselves and the world around us to um, experience more and to be able to access more of ourselves and more, uh, more of our own expression and be able to carry that out into the world. And so healing is just like this really beautiful process if we allow it to be that. Thank you for that. I know a lot of people get stuck in the healing and just wanting to be better that they forget about Mm -hmm. the beauty and the breakthroughs in the process. And I know I needed that message. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, you're welcome. It's a big thing to like, um, to be able to see and look back, like when you look back over like a year or two years or three years of your healing journey or process, look at all the things that it's brought into your life and all the ways that you've changed. And that's one of the things I, I mean, I look at that for myself all the time. And it's just like, also, it's really important to celebrate how far yes. we've come. So that's important as well. Yes, totally. I, as someone who used to push and burn out now that I'm more into this energy of allowing and appreciating you know, the little moments, just the fact that I could take a nap today. I appreciate that I got to do this. <laughs> so important to celebrate. It um, is. Will, it really is. Um, I wanted to wrap this up. I have so many more questions for you, but to keep this short and sweet, maybe I can bring you back for a next podcast follow-up. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, here's some rapid fire questions for you. What's okay. the best compliment you've ever received? um I would say um gosh any compliments that I've gotten about my um my voice I people have told me oh I know exactly um I I once had a flight attendant friend I used to be a flight attendant and I I had a, a flight attendant that I worked with on a flight to LA and as we were getting off the plane she's like your voice is so calming. I just want you to read me bedtime stories. And I was like, that is so sweet. <laughs> that is really awesome. And I, as I, I've gotten that, um, a similar compliment a few times. So I really love that my voice is really calming for people and soothing. I agree. I was like completely like <laughs> in a trance watching you talk about it, especially because you're so passionate and I'm learning so much. I'm like, whoa, I can hear you talk for hours. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> what's a book that's changed your life ah, ritual by Mali Doma Somme really great book um all about ritual and community and um absolutely wonderful book definitely ritual what does coming home mean to yourself mm, coming home that's about being really connected to my body it's about being connected to nature Um, to me coming home is like going for a hike in nature and like bringing my little mini harp and playing my harp in nature that's coming home (laughs) you play the harp yeah I do (laughs) that's so cool do you incorporate it in your sessions (laughs) 
I do. I love to incorporate it, um, especially in my group coaching sessions. And when, when we're going on the guided journeys together, I like to play the harp. It's really soothing. What would you like more of? Mm, more fun. I want more fun <laughs> and more play. <laughs> um, definitely lots of fun and play. And I think also more physical touch. I think that's something that I, I know I'm craving really deeply, especially now. So, yeah. Advice for your younger self? Um, hmm. You're always supported. Powerful. Yeah. Where can people find you? So my website is moonmedicine.co and I'm also on Instagram at moonmedicines and I have a, um, a weekly Instagram live where I, it's called the sacred journey. And I just talk about all the things that I've learned in my journey and experience and share some um, tips and anecdotes and things that I'm learning and plant medicines and things that can help us along in uh, enjoying more of life and, and enjoying more of the experience of our journeys and the healing process. What are some of your offers and programs? Yeah, so I actually have a program called Moon Mapping. It's an online course and it's all about the menstrual cycle, the different phases of the menstrual cycle, how the menstrual cycle works and different rituals um, to do at different phases of the cycle, different foods to eat and herbs to work with. So that's called moon mapping and uh, um, access to that is on my website. Um, but that's the, uh, one of the, my favorite courses that I have. And then I also have sacred cycles, which will be coming up very soon as an online course. And sacred cycles is all about the deeper aspects of menstrual wellness and healing and really coming into connection with the menstrual cycle and being able to heal imbalances that are leading to things like pain and missed cycles and heavy bleeding. Um, but through this really nature-based lens, so looking at all the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and all the different seasons of our menstrual cycle and connecting with ancestors, looking at diet and food and looking at the nervous system and working with herbs. So. That's a really big and powerful course. And that'll be up on my website soon. Soon. And you also have a group program. Yes. So that is Sacred Cycles group coaching program. And that happens twice a year. And I usually start it around the full moon in Cancer or the new moon in Cancer. And that's the, the womb moon. It's the mother moon. And the group coaching program is um, you part of that program is the sacred cycles online course and then the other part is eight weeks of coaching so we have two menstrual cycles together to delve into any um any healing any imbalances through working with rituals working with plants working with ancestors and doing a really deep dive into discovering your own medicine through um, collaborating with ancestors and plants so really powerful journey when is the next program so people can catch you. That'll be, yeah, that'll be in June of this year. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raven, for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. I've learned so much and I'm sure our listeners will really, really appreciate everything you've shared. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.